Um, thank you all so much for calling in today. We, we certainly appreciate it. Alice will go over the schedule that's coming up. Um, just to let you know that tomorrow night is the Mason Bee Talk. Um, if you would like to order Mason Bees in the house, we will have that. Um, you would order them and then stop by the office uh, and uh, we'll just set them in your car. So, uh, but that's coming <clears throat> a, week in, a week and a half after the talk. So uh, certainly there'll be more details if you call in that night. It's, it, is, it is a free talk. Um, with that, Alice. Alice is currently the president of the Master Gardener Foundation. Um, if you've been watching these for a while, you have certainly seen Alice's name and appreciate the great job she does in putting together for her talks. Alice, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, ask everybody to please mute, um, and we'll have questions at the end. And, with that, and if you have a question, please throw it in the chat box. Um, and with that, Alice, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Gary. Hi, folks. It's really good to see you. And hang on just a minute here. Gary, are you recording? Uh, more. Hold on just a second. Yes, I am recording. Okay. Um, let's let me go back to where I was. Okay. Like Gary said, we've got the Mason Bee talk coming up, and Billy does a wonderful job on that. And Mason bees are some of the earliest pollinators, and pollination is coming up real soon, too. So be sure to attend the class. There's, it's a fascinating topic. And you can see some of the others. Another good one is grape pruning and planning to plant. I mean, you, these gardens don't just pop up on their own. You do have to have some... Um, planning to go along with it. And in about a month, or at the end, or I'm sorry, toward the end of the month, we're going to talk about seed starting, and we'll have a class on it, and we're going to have kits available. So there are a lot of things to keep you interested. And I wanted to talk to you real quick about our plant sale. It's going to be online this year because we have absolutely no idea what's going to happen with, you know, our, our opening up our state or what the state of the pandemic is <clears throat> going to be. So it'll be online this year. Look for it. And we also have a plant and insect clinic. I think most of you probably know that. And as the season starts to progress and you start to see things in the, your garden that you aren't sure what's going on, be sure to give us a call. You can um, email is the best way or the website. It also emails us. And if you do um, send us pictures to it, it really helps get you the answer uh, more quickly. Okay. so. Let's get into uh, February, what's happening in February. It's actually a busy month in the garden. As strange as it might seem, you know, it's still winter, right? It's a very busy month. And we do a lot of uh, uh, pruning of shrubs and trees, and the fruit trees get pruned while they're still dormant. This is a good month for it because we usually have a couple, eh, like five, six days in a row of sunny weather. So that would be the time to do that. And we do have some problems that we're going to be talking about that might pop up this month. And then we'll talk about the different ways that you can get more information because I'm just kind of kind of talk, uh, just touch on these, a lot of them. First of all, people are asking, when should I prune the roses? And everybody says, well, let's do it on Washington's Day, which is Washington Day. I think it's the 22nd of February. But really, that's not a good measure because it really depends on the weather, how far along um, you know, spring progression is. And the best way to do it is wait until you see these forsythia trees over here on the right. You see them in full bloom. You'll find them all over all over the place. They're the only thing that blooms yellow this early in the season. When they've been there in full bloom, that's time to prune your roses. And we have a class on that coming up, too, on the, on the 23rd of this month. So people get really confused about which shrubs they can prune and which ones they shouldn't prune in the springtime. And it really makes a big difference. The rule of thumb is if it blooms in the springtime, then you can you have to prune it immediately after it's done flowering. Do not prune that like right now because if you do, you've chopped off all the flower buds. Um, when after the flowers bloom, and if you're going to do pruning, you would do it then. It forms next year's flowers during the summer, 
So if you chop those off now, you're not going to have blooms this spring. However, if you've got shrubs that bloom in the summertime, you can um, cut those off now. You can prune those if you feel the need to. Some of them are forsythia, like the picture over here. You don't want to do those. Um, but we will go on to the next slide where I actually have have um, specific flowers. However, you can remove dead, diseased, or damaged branches anytime. It doesn't really matter. Okay, these are the summer flowering shrubs that you do not want to prune now, or our spring, spring shrubs that you don't want to prune now. You can see an awful lot of them there. Forsythia is one, honeysuckle, mock orange. If you would like to see the full list, here's a link here. Don't prune your lilac now. It won't, it won't flower for you. Here's some that you should prune this month if you're going to prune, if it needs it. Just because you can prune doesn't mean you need to. Wisteria is one of those that you can prune now and about 10 times during the summer, too, because it will take over if you don't. There's some basic pruning cuts you should know. You don't want to just go out there for the most part and just chop, chop, chop. Yep, it's faster. But if you do that, you're probably going to end up with growth that you don't like. If you just chopped it off, say, right here, right there, you're going to end up with a whole bunch of fingerly finger growths on it, and it's not going to do the kind of shape of tree that you want. That's called a heading cut. The best way to do it would be to come down here and make the cut. There's a little collar. If you when you see go out and look at your tree or your bush, there's a little collar here. You don't want to cut that off. You want to cut just beyond that. So instead of making those heading cuts where you cut off the top, go in there and make these thinning cuts down to the big branch. When you're pruning, you want to look at the shape of that shrub. What's it supposed to look like? You don't want to take, a, a, for example, a lilac bush and turn it into a box. So look at the natural shape of it and try to work with that. One of the reasons we prune is to get rid of the um, extra green growth, the vegetative growth, so that we can get a lot of air circulation and um, light into the tree or the bush. A lot of diseases here in, in the Pacific Northwest are caused by the wet, rainy weather we have. And on the days when it does you know, warm up and dry out a little bit, you want the air to be able to come through the, the plant. And one way to do that is to trim it so that it's a little bit more open to the, the wind and to the rain. Um, these books here, the American Horticultural Society Pruning and Training Book, is wonderful because, well, and so is Cass Turnbull's, the next book. Both of them um, go into the details of what it takes to um, make each bush, each type of bush you have in your yard, how to prune it, how to take care of it, and that way you won't make any mistakes. I would highly recommend that. But there's a really good article here, too. And at the end of this, we're going to make this entire um, presentation, all these notes here, available to you. There's another kind of, whoops, there's another kind of pruning, too. A lot of people call and ask, well, I've got this giant rhododendron, or I've got this old, old lilac bush. What do I do? You can do renovation pruning. And there are different ways to do it. Most of the time it's done in the springtime, which means that you're not going to have flowers that year and probably for several years after if you prune it down to 6 to 10 inches to the ground. But if you do it in thirds, gradually, if you do it the first year, you take out these, the next year you take out a couple more, and the third year you take out the rest, it'll start flowering sooner but you'll still have a couple years without it, but your tree will be happier, or your bush will be happier in the long run. And you'll be happier because you won't have to take it out because it's blocking a window or, or um, in the way. So we get a lot of questions about hydrangeas, and it's, it can be very confusing because you hear people say, you know, prune them in the spring, no, prune them in the fall, no, prune them in the winter. Well, there's a reason for that. There are different kinds of hydrangeas, each of which gets pruned in different times of the year.
I, on the other hand, have one of these <laughs> hydrangea paniculatas. I can't remember the name of it. I think it might be lime something or another. It's out in my front yard, and it gets pruned regularly about, oh, three times a year because the deer, although it's a deer-resistant plant, the deer love it, and they prune it all the way back probably three or four times a year. It's really not a good place for it. It's, I mean, it's happy there except for the, the deer. So another, you know, live and learn. I live in the country. I think I'd know better. So these are really good links for finding out about hydrangeas. So here, this will simplify it. So you've got the spring pruning ones. You've got the smooth hydrangeas, which are also called the wild hydrangeas. They have heart-shaped leaves. Most of, uh, most of, well, none of the other uh, hydrangeas have heart-shaped leaves. So if you have a heart-shaped leaf hydrangea that's white and looks like this, then it can be um, pruned now. The panicle hydrangea, the ones with the big pointy tops, they can be pruned now. But these are the ones that you don't want to prune in spring. The popular mop heads, you know, the big round balls that turn pink or blue. They turn a brilliant blue out here because of our acidic soil. And the lace caps. And the mountain hydrangea looks like a lace cap. It also doesn't get pruned in the spring. A lot of people have these oak leaf hydrangeas, which are just absolutely gorgeous for uh, color. They, um, they're white during the summer. And in the fall, the flowers kind of turn a pinkish bronze, and the leaves turn a nice deep bronze. They're a beautiful plant. And climbing hydrangea, I understand they do very well out here. I, I've never seen them here. I came from Ohio, and they did very well there. But they're they're not ones that you'd prune in the spring. You would um, you would want to prune those back lightly after they bloom. So ornamental grasses. We've got some ornamental grasses out front that just keep getting bigger and bigger. And you've got to take care of them. And to help them grow, you need to cut them like you would any other grass. And an easy way to do it is to either get tape or we've used bungee cords. And this picture here shows uh, just pruners, and that doesn't work for us. We actually have to get hedge clippers because we've got, they're about, oh, about 18 inches in diameter, the plantings we have, and that works too. Um, have a tarp there or something so that you can put the cutoff grasses on it. Evergreens. Folks want to start chopping at their evergreens, but you know, they really don't need a lot of pruning. Uh, you can take out diseased, dead, damaged branches or ones that are in your way and chop those off anytime. But just like, I'm sorry, with every, every shrub, never remove more than a third of a plant at any time unless you're doing renovation pruning. It takes a long time, three to four years for any kind of a uh, shrub to recover from renovation pruning. But you, if you want to, you can prune spruces firs and Douglas firs. You can do it now, but it should be before that new bright green tip growth starts. Yews and hemlocks, you can prune to get them to their approximate size now, and then you can do it again in mid-June. And uh, the pines and arborvitae, you should wait until spring, or spring, summer after they start growing. Any time during February, March, part of April perhaps, it's a good time to plant a bare root fruit tree. But you should be doing it before the buds, those little bitty places where the leaves are going to appear before they start to swell. They should already be planted. And there are some explicit directions at, at this particular um, website. The big thing is to make your hole, any kind of transplant hole, should be wider than it is deep. Think saucer instead of bowl. And when you lay the, the roots in the planting bed, put a little mound of soil there at the bottom and spread the roots out and then go ahead and fill it in. But make sure that there's a root where that root flare there is above the ground. And people ask, well, should I put fertilizer in? Should I put compost in? Nope. The only thing you should put back in that hole is the uh, soil that came out of it and, and water it. And the reason being, if you put some really good soil or really good soil amendments like, um, you know, fertilizer or not fertilizer, compost, 
that plant is going to want to stay right there and not put roots out into the soil beyond the hole. It's going to want to stay where the soil's the best. So if you put the regular soil back in, it, it will spread its roots a lot better and be healthier in the long run. Another problem we have, especially during the winter days like this, and you get one of those really warm days and the sun comes beating down on some of those, the trunks of some of those young trees, it, it has a, the effect where it warms up during the day, it gets cold at night, and the bark splits. And just like with a cut on your hand, when you've got, um, it, it opens it up to disease and, and insects. So if you want to help prevent that splitting, of the trees. You can paint the outside of it with a diluted half-half water um, and indoor white latex paint, or you can buy one of the tree wraps, that um, they, the commercial tree wraps that they sell. And this is the month to prune fruit trees. They're going to be starting to get into their bud stages and starting to leaf out probably in March, maybe late March. So now would be the time to do it. I've put a lot of links here on how to prune apples, and pears, and plums, and we had a talk on that a couple weeks ago, and I hope you had a chance to see it. But if you haven't, this is probably the best book I have ever seen, or publication from a, a university. Oregon State puts it out, How to Train and Prune Your Home Orchard. It will take you through every single step. It's an absolutely fantastic resource. But you want to get that done before the buds start opening up. The, uh, the individual ones here, it will tell you how to do that. Uh, Peaches get pruned in the spring, but usually in the summer, too, because the, they need to get the light on the inside of the, the tree. Raspberries, you can start taking off the dead, broken, diseased, uh, and damaged canes now, but the new canes should be starting to come up, um, and they're, they're, they're green. They came up at the end of last year, and they don't look brown and all dead like they did, uh, like the other ones do. You should have really started to do that la at the end of last year and took out all the canes that had given you fruit last year because they won't give fruit this year. And the new ones that did come up while those were growing, those are the fruiting canes for this year. They call them prima canes. Last year's prima canes or this year's fruiting canes. You can prune your blueberries, but it's probably better to wait until early to mid-March on a day when it's not raining so that the branches, the pruned branches will get a chance to dry. We're going to be talking an awful lot next month about what to do in March, and that's a busy month too because that's when you start with the fertilizing and with more of the um, steps you can take to prevent disease and insects in your fruit trees. And grapes, you can prune them now or in early March, but art Fuller is going to give a grape care and pruning workshop on February 10th at 6 p.m. And if you have grapes or know somebody that has grapes, let them know or please come and attend. And um, it's, it's not as complicated as it sounds, but you really have to know what you're doing, and Art can help you with that. So on February 10th at 6 p.m., we'd like to see you there. So now is the time to start preventing, actually, Last month was the month you would start to protecting for, for these things. But peaches, almost everybody that has peaches in western Washington has peach leaf curl. And this picture doesn't do it justice because the, the uh, leaves are just gnarly looking. They are twisted and curled and they've got that red on them. And you can start in January. And with the rain we have here, you'll want with a copper fungicide and you'll want to be spraying every three weeks until um, you start to see little buds swelling up on the, the uh, branches. That's when you stop. You don't want them to be open. You don't want to spray the leaves with the copper fungicide. Now, cherries and plums, we have a lot of crinium blight in, uh, and, and brown brown rot, which is bacterial gamosis in our area. This is what bacterial gamosis looks like. If you had this last, year's, last year on your cherries and plums, you definitely will want to treat for this. Uh, corneum blight 
it's more of a leaf problem. The, the uh, bacterial brown rot is more of a, a leaf problem, but the crinium, or I'm sorry, a blossom problem, but the crinium blight is mostly a leaf problem. The bacterial problem also affects the fruit. You'll see kind of a round, concentric, fuzzy stuff on the fruit. So if you had that last year, you want to uh, take care of it. And this chlorotho uh, chlorothalonil is probably the best treatment for it. You could use copper-based sprays as well, but this has been shown to be a little bit more effective. Um, you don't want to do it when it's really cold out, but between 40 and 45 degrees, which is what we've been having you know, pretty much all winter so far, it'd be a good time for it. And pears, we haven't had a whole lot of problem with pears other than scab, and you can't do anything about that right now. Um, well, you can. I'll talk about that in a minute. But we did have pear blister mite. If you had pear leaves that had these little dots all over them, and they turn brown as the season uh, progresses. They look, kind of look like railroad tracks because they're centered around the, that, that middle vein there. That's pear leaf blister mite. And you can spray with a horticultural oil. We don't have lime sulfur here, so you can't use that. But horticultural dormant oil, you can spray with that between uh, when the temperatures are the same thing. That'll help to take care of it. For uh, apple scab, there's really not a whole lot you can do now except remove the leaves or if you've got too many leaves and too many trees and you can't clean them up, um, run, them, run over them with a lawnmower. The more you chop them, the less chance there is for that uh, uh, fungal inoculum to spread. And that's a good rule of thumb anytime. At the end of the season, clean off all the leaves from the bottom of the tree because they carry fungus and when the rain comes it just kind of lets those spores go everywhere. Hey Alice. Yeah. You have a question in the chat box when talking about pears. Does this include Asian pears? I don't think Asian pears get the pear leaf blister mite. They do get scab I think. I'm not even sure about that but they don't get the pear leaf blister mite. I wouldn't spray anything unless you had a problem last year. The big problem with Asian pears that I've seen is codling moth, and you don't have to do anything about codling moth or apple maggot yet. Is Does that answer your question? I'm trying, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't hit the unmute button fast enough. Okay. So let's move into the vegetable garden. I hope you're all planning your vegetable gardens and looking at seed catalogs and reading the back of the, the uh, packets because you need to know when you can plant them. But WSU has an amazing chart, and I only put January and February here, um, of when you should start planting things. Now, the ones with green were planted in the fall. It's time to harvest some of these. Um, these... The seedling growth, those were also planted probably around Christmas time, and they'll be harvested. The ones we need to look at are the ones where you're direct seeding collards at the end of February. You can transplant Swiss chard and chicory at the end of February. Asparagus, you can transplant now. Let's see what's over here. Leek, uh, summer lettuce. Mustard or onion bulbs, you can plant your onion sets now. And peas, you can plant pea, um, pea seeds directly into the garden. And let me show you the next slide. This is what you'll see. I know it's busy, but look at the bottom of it here. Seedling growth is yellow, and the dot means you direct seed it, and the slash means that you can transplant it if you've started it indoors. So it's a really great reference to have and these two publications one from Washington State that's where these charts are from um, and the, the home I'm sorry it's from this one the home vegetable gardening in Washington but the gardening in Washington State is a kind of a place where they have collected all the links that you would ever need to know how to grow anything you want and if there are things about composting 
Let me see if I can bring that out. Can you see this, folks? Art, can you see this page? We can. Okay. This is the gardening in Washington State, and it's got something for everybody. Flower beds, fruit, garden construction, lawns, organic gardening. And each time you open up one of these, let's do vegetable gardens. You've got even more links. If you want to know how to grow cucumbers here, green peas, bush beans, a little bit of everything. So it's a really, really fantastic resource. We saw some of this kind of damage last year, army worms. Have you ever seen anything like this in your garden? These are the um, caterpillars of, of kind of a very dull, nondescript, brown, noctuid uh, moth. These get huge. They, I've seen them the size of my little finger, maybe even longer than that, and they're kind of greasy looking. If you've ever seen these in your soil, they're about about an inch long. That's probably what they are. Um, they're, I think my next slide shows when they're smaller. Now's the time to get rid of them. If, you, if this has happened to your lawn and you dig up a portion of the green part next to the dead part and you find these there, then you can find you can get some granules of a there's a uh, uh, spinosad containing granules that is an organic way of taking care of the problem. There's Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt, is a good treatment in general for caterpillars, but they're, it's only effective on these guys when they're very tiny. And by the time the damage appears, they're not tiny anymore. You want to get them before they turn to the pupa stage because that's like the time bomb in your garden. This is what they might look like in the in the grass. So there's a couple of different granular spinosads that uh, that Hortsense talks about, and I'll show you Hortsense in a minute. But uh, they work pretty well, and army worms as well. They're all they're army worms and cut worms are all caterpillars of different kind of noctuid moths, and always. Keep your lawn fertilized, irrigated, and cut because that makes a very healthy lawn, and healthy lawns crowd out anything else. Army worms and cutworms. The cutworms get into your garden, and they will chop off new growth just like this. You'll see it looks like a rabbit got it, but chances are a lot of times it's a cutworm. You can't really, there's no really good way to treat for it. Um, in fact, Hortsense really doesn't recommend anything. What they recommend is putting a little collar around the base of the plants. One of our master gardeners went one step further and got a, a tin can, opened both ends of it, cut it up and snipped it, and then shoved it about two inches into the ground And because she was getting so frustrated with the cutworms. <laughs> a couple years ago, a lady brought in a, a, a coffee can. She says, can you tell me what these are? And she opened it up, and there must have been Oh, 200 of those cutworms. So you really have to, if you see any damage like that right away, take care of it. And the funny thing is, even though these cutworms are so big, you may not see them because they're, uh, I can't remember which one of them is nocturnal. I think the, I think the cutworms are nocturnal. But uh, they live under the soil during the day and they come out at night. One thing I want to talk real quick about is integrated pest management. A lot of people are a lot more environmentally conscious now than they were. People used to call us and say, I've got this problem, what can I spray on it? Well, there's a lot better way of going about it, and it requires you to get out there and look at your garden all the time. If there's a problem, try to keep an eye on it and see how bad the problem it is how bad the problem is. And also talk to yourself and say, you know, how much can I stand? Is this really a problem or is it um, something I can live with? It's not really harming anything. It's not, you know, gonna, it's not taking over the world. One of our, uh, our plant pathologists up in Puyallup, our WSU plant pathologist, Jenny Glass, has a 15-foot roll. And I think she said in the past couple of years, it's a 30-foot rule. She says, if you can't see it at 30 feet, it's not a problem. So 
you know, don't try to make your garden perfect. It's not going to be. And the other thing is, if you go and spray, just indiscriminately spray for some insect that you see, you're going to end up killing all the uh, good insects too. The presence of the, the, the bad insects is what actually attracts the good insects to your garden. So you, you don't want to automatically do something like that. Um, a really good source for information for us as Master Gardeners, for you as homeowners, is HortSense. And I'm going to click on that because I want to show you how this works. There's several different ways you can search if you want to know about apple trees. You go to the tree fruits, and you go to apple, and you can go down the list. And it will tell you, let me, let's go to... Let's go to anthracnose because that's another problem that we have here. It will tell you how, what the disease is, how it progresses. It'll give you a lot of different ways to manage the problem without chemicals. Um, in this case, you prune out the bad areas. You don't do that now. You have to do that in uh, dry weather. Um, and then it gives you chemical management as well. And it tells you some of the times to do it, and it tells you always, always follow the label directions to protect our pollinators, yourself, and the environment. But it's a fantastic resource. Um, we as master gardeners use it all the time. So the, the big thing is get out there and look at your plants. You need to get a handle on it right away after you've instituted you know, like clean up the leaves under whatever the cultural things are. You go back out and monitor it again and see what the pro if the problem is still there. And it's a continual watch, treat with the least toxic methods. If necessary, use a chemical method and then get back out there and start all over again. So we talked about which shrubs we should prune, which ones we shouldn't. We're not going to prune shrubs that bloom in the spring because they won't have flowers that season if you do because they uh, set their flower buds last year. We're going to prune, if necessary, flowers that bloomed in, the, bloomed in the summer and fall now because they will set their fruit on the new growth that comes out the spring. We talked about how to prune different shrubs and how to do renovation pruning of overgrown shrubs. And we talked about um, that you can prune off any dead, diseased, damaged, or dangerous branches at any time. We talked about the different kind of hydrangeas, which we can prune, which we can prune now, and which we can't. And I have a cat crawling across here. Um, we talked about how to cut back ornamental grasses. Something else I wanted to say about the ornamental grasses: make sure it's a grass. Make sure it's not um, a carex, a uh, sedge. And the way you tell that is by rolling it in your fingers. If it rolls, it's a grass, the blade. And if it's kind of uh, rough and it feels like it's got ridges, then it's a uh, sedge. Sedges have edges, and um, the grass rolls. Grass has joints. We talked about army worms and cutworms and what you can do about that in integrated pest management. And here it is pretty much all in two pages with a little bit more information and azalea lace bugs too we you can start looking for azalea lace bugs but check out the list check out the um the links to these art did you post that in the chat art yeah it's in there Okay, thank you. The links to the last four talks we gave on pruning and care selection of apple trees and how to control um, pests and diseases on fruit trees and this one are in the chat box. And that's all I have. There's a lot of good links here, though, a lot of good links, so make sure that you check them out. Does anybody I have, have any I do. I have three questions in the chat oh. box. Okay. Um, is it okay to put seasoned horse manure around the base of fruit trees to keep the deer away? They, they suggest not actually putting anything around fruit trees to uh, increase nitrogen until they're actively growing. So probably not during the winter. 
I also really question whether they're really going to keep the deer away. I, I don't think so. I think you'll get some fertilizer from them, and because it's organic, it'll be slow breaking down. I'm not sure it's going to do anything about your deer. I don't think so. And also, you want to be careful you don't over-fertilize the trees so they don't overproduce. So I don't know if horse manure would be quite the answer. And, and too much fertilizer in fruit trees gives you an awful lot of green growth and probably not as much fruit as you'd like. Correct. Uh, okay, next question. How many weeks before transplanting do you start your seeds indoors? Depends on the kind of seeds. Um, that's where you want to get out the packet, your seed packet. If it's tomatoes, um, that takes four to six weeks from the time you plant the seed to the time that you put it in your um, garden. So plan accordingly. It's uh, If you're going to put it in the garden in in May, you're you're really pushing it um, unless you're going to be covering it with something to protect it because we still have very cold nights and those are like peppers and cucumbers and things like that. They are summer vegetables and don't like the cold. If you um, oh cucumbers especially oh they're very sensitive to the cold and those should be probably transplanted within within three weeks. If you are in doubt, you know that chart I showed you. That chart will guide you very carefully through when to plant, which kind of vegetable, and if you plant it from seed, that's where you see the little dot. Let me go back there. So you you plant the you let's see let's let's do this one. That's when you plant it outdoors. I, I don't actually, I see what you, you're thinking. It doesn't actually show you when to transplant from outdoors. This, these are when you can transplant things outside. But your seed packet is going to tell you that you don't want to put it out until the last freezing date. And, and if it tells you that you transplant four to six weeks after starting the seed, then you kind of work backwards from that. But remember, we still have really cold nights. And all it takes is one night of 30 degrees that will wipe out all your, your little transplants. Um, the other um, thing is it, the soil has to be at least 50 degrees for those roots to grow. So if your soil isn't um, 50 degrees, it's senseless to start to plant, transplant them early. You're not going to gain anything. Also, Alice, check the, don't just put your hand on the soil on the top. Right. Put your hands down in where the roots are going to be and feel how warm or cold it is. Well, you can also use a meat thermometer, a kitchen thermometer, and put it down in there at the root zone, seven, nine inches. And if it's 50 degrees, you're in good shape. And one way that you can get that soil a little bit warmer, a little bit faster, number one, raised beds, they warm up faster than the ground soil. You can always cover your the area with a clear with clear plastic. They used to say black plastic, but now they say cover it with clear plastic for about a month before, and that the the, um, the ground will warm up nice and fast for you. Um, a comment: University of Maine has an article uh, online. Guinea fowl may be the solution to your insect pest problems. Um, guinea. I, I, nice. I, I missed what you said, Gary. I'm sorry. Um, an article put out by Maine. And it's, it's guinea fowl may be solution to your insect pest problems. Um, I agree, including slugs. That's yes. why be Joe Beckett. But they're uh, also noisy. That's be right. I, that's because Joe has guinea hens. They're, they're also good watch birds. If yes. you got somebody coming in your property, you got a oh, guinea egg, you know about they're it. They're going to let everybody know about it. Uh, oh, yeah. Next question. I recently purchased a home with two dozen fruit trees. The previous owner wrapped all the fruit trees in um, four-foot wire mesh to protect them from deer. When it is okay to move the uh, wire cages? If the trunks are greater than a certain diameter, is it reasonable to discard the material? I don't think a four-foot fence around a big tree is, I mean, are the leaves, can the deer get the leaves? You know, if it's if it's still protecting the leaves, and I, I find that hard to believe, my husband has a four-foot fence around his trees, and the leaves poke through, and the deer eat them. I don't think it has anything to do with the size of the trunk. It's whether or not the um, edible, <laughs> deer edible parts of the tree are avail available to them. The leaves are unprotected. Yeah, there you go. 
I, then I, I don't think that the, the four-foot fence is going to take care of that, unless I'm misunderstanding something. She may want to know if it's going to kill the, uh, if the trunk gets large enough, if the nibbling on the leaves is going to kill the tree or if it, it can withstand the, the deer damage. I don't know. That's my guess. Okay. Wh whoever asked that question, um, go ahead and unmute so we can get some more, get a little bit more information, okay? I think that was Reed. There we go. Uh, okay, Reed, could you tell me what you meant? Mm. Hmm. I think the best solution myself is to fence in your area around the trees somehow. And and I don't mean just four-foot fence. I mean fence in the area where your trees are so that the deer can't get there, get around them. Alice? Yes? Uh, I have a... a cosmetically unattractive way to protect an apple tree too or fruit trees okay. and that is if you have access to pallets you can turn them on their sides you can get eight foot pallets you can get fairly tall pallets not true lash them together and I've seen it done we've actually donated pallets for this purpose and a friend of ours went and protected each one of his trees by putting them out in a perimeter so that the leaves could not be reached and the apples could not be reached. Well, that's a good solution. They're not attractive, it? but they get the job done. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, they would. Sounds like a good idea. Once you get a tree that's, and I, and I use the word mature, and I realize that's pretty haphazard, but uh, if you've got a tree that's mature, it's up, and the deer is not getting to the upper leaves, it's just kind of munching on the lower leaves, it's not going to hurt the tree. Right. Um, lose a little bit of leaves. Uh, they're probably going to eat the, the fruit that drops on the ground. But in terms of the, the tree itself, it'll be, uh, it'll be fine. 